Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's Women at NJPAC's Virtual Women Leaders at Work series, our newly launched series of online conversations with women business executives and leaders from New Jersey and beyond. I'm Sarah Rosen, and I serve as the Managing Director of Women at NJPAC. Women at NJPAC have always, women have always had a, a seat at the table at NJPAC. And I'm happy now to be able to bring you these new enlightening discussions as an expansion of our Women at NJPAC programming. In fact, the Arts Center has remained vibrant and relevant over the last year with more than 500 free events online. I wanna start off by thanking our partner, Executive Women of New Jersey and our friends at PwC for their invaluable assistance in launching this new series. Before I introduce you to our Women at NJPAC president, Faith Taylor, let me remind you of our timing for today. We will have a 40 minute conversation with our incredible panel, who you will meet shortly, led by our moderator. That will be followed by 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A with you, our audience. So we hope you will submit your questions via the Q&A function on your screen. And we do promise to conclude by 1 p.m. So settle in, we hope you enjoy our Lunch and Learn program that we've pulled together. And it's now my pleasure to introduce the president of Women at NJPAC and the environmental social governance leader at Tesla, Faith Taylor. Hi, Faith. Hi, Sarah, thank you so much. And welcome everyone. As a president at MJPAC, I am so proud to be a part of this great project. It has been a labor of love. And really, it is very important that an event, as Sarah says, the first of, of its kind in terms of programming and really focus on, focusing in on women in business. Um, our program is focused on building communities and connections and women leaders empowering women. That is so important. And I really wanna make sure that uh, you understand the opportunity and, and hopefully learn something new here. Um, I was involved with the report seat at the table with Anna Maria Tejada, the president of the Executive Women of New Jersey. And that report focused on women in, on the boards and also the journey that it takes to get there, stay there and continue to build. So with that, I would love to introduce Anna Maria Tejada, president of the Executive Women of New Jersey. Anna. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's very important event. Thank you, Faith, for that wonderful introduction. As president of Executive Women of New Jersey, I am so proud that we are partnering up with women at NJPAC to have this conversation. EWNJ's mission, as Faith has said, has always been to advocate for um, increasing the number of women on corporate boards in executive leadership position. And with that, I want to encourage you to look at our most latest report, Seat at the Table, which Faith mentioned, which focuses exactly on this very same topic. And so with that, I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator for today's event, which is Leah Malone at PwC. I hope each and every one of you uh, enjoy this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Leah. I am a director in PwC's Governance Insight Center. We're a small group at PwC. We focus exclusively on corporate governance. So as part of my day job, I talk with boards of directors and management teams about the various governance issues that they're facing. So I'm happy to be here today talking to a wonderful panel of female corporate board directors who are gonna tell us about their experience in the boardroom, what it's like to be a director, kind of uncovering all of the secrets of board service, um, in, in particular focusing on what it's like to be a female board director. So uh, let me introduce our panelists. First, Micheline Davis is joining us. She serves on the board of CMC Energy. She was formerly the executive vice president and chief corporate affairs officer of RWJ Barnabas Health. She recently just took a new role as the president and CEO of National Medical Fellowships. 
She started her career as an attorney uh, before joining RWJ Barnabas and served as the chief policy counsel to former governor of New Jersey, John Corson. Among a host of other roles, Micheline is also the president emeritus of the Executive Women of New Jersey, and she's the treasurer of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center Women's Association. So we're so happy to have Micheline with us today. We also are joined by Sharon Taylor. She is a director at New Jersey Resources, a natural gas and clean energy company, and at Higher View. Sharon has more than 40 years of experience in business and in particular in human resources, serving as the senior vice president of human resources and the chairperson of the Prudential Foundation until her retirement in 2017. She's been serving on public company boards for almost a decade now with a much longer experience even than that in the nonprofit sector and has experience working with religious entities, other nonprofits, and brings to us a very wide range of her experience in different types of boardrooms. Finally, Sheila Penrose is joining us. She, over the last two decades, has served as an independent director for major global companies across a range of industries, as well as on numerous nonprofit and advisory boards. Currently, she serves as a director on the McDonald's board and on the board of Jones Lang LaSalle, where for 15 years, she was one of the very few women to chair the board of a Fortune 150 company. Sheila co-founded and co-chairs the Corporate Leadership Center, which partners with Fortune 500 companies to augment and accelerate the leadership development of their top executives. She's also an advisor to several CEOs. She's British by birth, but American by choice, and has usually been the first and the only woman in the room in her career. So she's dedicated to changing that for other women. So thank you to all of these wonderful panelists for joining me. To start out, I kind of want to take half a step back to think about and to talk about corporate boards and sort of what corporate boards look like today. Um, if you were to go back in time, maybe 25, 30 years, you would see that at many companies, even large public companies, boards were mostly made up of kind of friends and family of uh, the executives at the company. Many of the executives sat in the boardroom. You'd have kind of your local bankers, your lo local lawyers sitting on the board as well. That's evolved obviously over the last couple of decades as uh, rules have been put into place to require independent directors on public company boards. And as the companies themselves realize the value of independent directors in the room. So as we've seen this evolution of the types of people serving on boards, we still um, to this day tend to see boards that are kind of dominated by a certain type of person. Um, for the most part, the majority of directors on public company boards are men. Most of them are white. Most of them are over the age of 65. Um, from my perspective, working with many boards of directors and management teams on various issues in governance, the topic of board diversity and what boards should look like is one of the few that's really dominating many of those conversations. There are not many corporate boards that I speak to today that aren't at least thinking about the issue. But I just wanna level set on kind of where things stand um, in terms of diversity in corporate boards. The numbers are stark. In the uh, S&P 500, yes, every board in that group has at least one female director. If we take uh, a look at the Russell 3000, so a, a much broader group of companies, only 19% of the seats on those boards are filled by women. If you look at the number of seats filled by black directors, it's only 5%, only 3% are filled by Latinx directors. So when you think about board diversity, I think there's still quite a ways to go. Um, let me turn to the panelists with some questions. So to start out, uh, Sharon, I'm going to start with you. Uh, taking a look at kind of board service, I gave you a couple of stats of sort of what boards look like today, but can you give us a better sense of kind of what does a board do? What does it mean to serve on a board? And what has your experience been having this broad range of experience with public companies, private companies, nonprofits? Can you talk about that in your experience? Sure. Um... You know, the board really has a responsibility broadly for three things. One, they provide oversight um, for the strategy of the organization, you know, to ensure that 
um, the organization is meeting the goals and objectives that um, are going to carry the company forward and ensure its profitability to um, their shareholders. So it, that brings with it a fiduciary responsibility uh, to ensure that they are being good stewards of the, of the shareholders and investment money. And they have a responsibility um, to ensure that the organizational structure is aligned in such a way that enables that performance. And they have a heavy hand in talent and succession, CEO succession, senior leadership succession, Boards do their work through committees, and the committees really align with those strategies and processes that need to and en that enable the directors, if you would, to provide their oversight functions. So there's an audit committee, there's a finance committee, there's a governance committee whose responsibility, to your point, Leah, is to do board recruitment and uh, uh, oversight, et cetera. There's a compensation and leadership development committee. Um, that's responsible for succession, talent management, compensation, benefits, um, et cetera, to ensure that um, pay packages and the like are aligned. So um, the, 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 the responsibility and goals of the, of the board are not to do the day-to-day -day work, but to ensure that the strategy is sound, that the governance uh, is in place, that their fiduciary responsibility and risks are managed, and that work is done through a, a, a network of, 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 of committees uh, to ensure that that happens. And in many ways, in smaller boards, uh, in not-for-profit boards, um, it's the, the same kind of mindset uh, in terms of what gets done. So, um, you know, for a number of years, um, I've been on boards of varying sizes, but in many ways, they perform, uh, they operate rather in the same way that I've described that public company boards operate, just on a smaller scale and perhaps with fewer committees. Micheline, can I turn to you for a moment and have you tell us maybe from your experience in the boardroom, what is it that you think makes someone a good director, enables someone to kind of fulfill all of those duties that Sharon just kind of explained? What do you think boards are looking for? Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really believe that in addition to um, what my fellow panelist Sharon uh, has just articulated so beautifully is really also the fact that boards are looking for um, board members to be prepared to have really done their due diligence and, and uh, of course, um, gone through all of the board packaging, um, but also really looking for you to bring your lens of uh, your particular uh, background of expertise to that table. And so it is not just um, the fact that we would all um, read a particular document and have researched the reports, but it's also, and so what does that mean for me with my background in marketing or for me with my background in human resources as, as uh, Sharon has, um, or for me, someone with a background in policy and equity, right? So to be able to translate the strategic planning steps of the board um, of the company in a manner that is really best fit for that particular industry that helps to advance them. I really believe that um, the best boards are looking for the diversity of thought that every member, despite background, ethnicity, age, et cetera, and that every individual brings from their own unique lived experience, but undoubtedly that diversity of thought is enhanced when you have women at that table. And then that much more so when you also have women of color. So a, a really great company is looking for board members to bring all of themselves to that particular body and to be able to offer opinion and expertise in going forward. Uh, Sheila, kind of digging into that question a little bit about diversity and uh, the role of women in the boardroom, as I mentioned, uh, women are still filling only a relatively small percentage of seats on boardrooms. From your perspective, what do you think changes when there's a female director in the room having, of course, been the only one um, on many of your boards for many years? How do you think the dynamics change? Why does it matter um, to have women in, in those roles? Well, thank you, Leah, and it's good to be with you and with Sharon and with Micheline and everyone who's joined the program today. Um, 
I'm, I'm a founding member of the 30% Club, which was driving for 30% representation of women on boards. We're not quite there yet, but we've made some progress. Um, but that's just an average. And as you said, um, for the Russell 3000 and other measures that you look at, the progress hasn't been so, so impressive. Um, I'm, I'm really proud that at JLL, we have half of our independent board members who are women. Uh, in fact, we have just one American born white male on the board. So we've kind of redefined uh, a minority, if you will. Um, but you have to be intentional about it. You have to be very deliberate about it. And why does it matter? It matters to the executives in the company if they see representation on the board that looks like them. It increasingly matters to shareholders who are, who are starting to measure how much diversity we have on our boards. And it matters to the executive team. It's a message to that team as to what's expected in terms of their own performance. Um, how does it change what happens within the boardroom? I think it changes the conversation. Um, I'm gonna generalize here, but I think female board members tend to ask more questions than express opinions. And I think that's a valuable way to probe management. Um, I think we end up changing the profile of the board candidates um, so that they're not all ex-CEOs um, who may be a bit clubby in their approach to one another. And it means that the executive team is anticipating that you're gonna talk about inclusion and diversity and that your male colleagues on the board are gonna pick up that conversation too. It's not just gonna be a conversation that the women or the people of color have to drive. Um, it's not enough to have one woman on the board. Uh, some people argue that there should be a rule of three. Um, and the way I like to explain it is if you're the only woman on the board, then you're expected to raise issues about representation. If there are two of you on the board, then the men start to wonder what you're talking about when you're in the ladies room. And if there are three of you on the room, nobody cares anymore. You're, you're there because of your credentials. You're there because of the contribution that you make um, and the question about your gender, your background is, is not a question anymore. Are you, do you think boardrooms are sort of changing as you think about the last, especially the last five to 10 years as they are diversifying more and we've gone from being the only woman on the board to being one of several or about half of the independent directors. How do you think that changes the dynamic in the boardroom? How does that change boardroom culture? Well, it, it obviously changes the discussion we've just been having around inclusion and diversity and who is actually sitting around the board table. But I think we've also seen changes in the agenda. I mean, things like cybersecurity, digital, sustainability, these are issues that are on the board agenda now. And what that does, I think, is widen the frame for who should be in the boardroom. So that's not necessarily gonna be a CEO or even someone who's a direct report to the CEO. Um, and that opens up the aperture for people of broader backgrounds and, and broader representation to be present in the boardroom. Um, I think there are also more expectations for companies to take a stand on societal issues. I mean, if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is kind of the annual survey about how institutions are trusted, corporations come out on top. They're ahead of the media, they're ahead of government, they're even ahead of nonprofits. Um, and employees are getting more active in how they want their company to align themselves with societal values. So that becomes a board discussion. And it's valuable to have people of various backgrounds around the table to take part in that. Um, finally, I would say we're seeing more issues in the boardroom that I would call crisis related issues. You know, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's a financial crisis, whether it's some lapse in ethical behavior that's happened within the company. And all of these require um, a range of viewpoints and a, and a range of experiences to be sitting around the table. You know, to that point, Sheila, I think it's not just anecdotal that female directors do see some of these issues differently. At PwC, we conduct an annual corporate director survey, and we look at the responses uh, that we receive from male directors versus female directors. 
And year after year, female directors are more likely to say that issues like climate change or um, human, human rights, immigration, social issues should really be impacting company strategy. That's just one example of the different ways that male and female responses uh, respond differently to the survey, but they really do kind of think about a, an issue as essential as company strategy in different ways. I think that's important. Sharon, could you jump in and give us some of your thoughts about how you think boardrooms have changed or evolved in the last five, 10 years? Where do you see things going from here? Um, well, to Sheila's earlier point, I think that the thinking is broader. Um, directors are um, being forced to, to look at things through a different lens and dig, dig more deeply into things that go simply beyond the profitability, debit and credit of it all. You know, cybersecurity, risk management, um, 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 how um, our business, I work for a public utility, impacts the environment and how might we position ourselves in a way that creates win-win solutions for both um, the environmental community, the, our customer community and our employee base. Um, I think, you know, when you look at someone with my background, um, um, as our board was evolving and changing its strategy, um, there was a view uh, among some that the same team that got us to where we were going wasn't going to be able to take us to where we needed to be. I think that, you know, um, to Micheline's point, um, there is a lot, there are a lot more, uh, there are a lot more in-depth conversations about the talents within the organization, um, succession management within the organization, and the diversity therein, because um, our world requires that level of thinking. And um, the old adage that you can't find anyone or no one's there or people aren't qualified just, just doesn't hold true any longer. And I think if you're on committees like governance, um, you have a duty and responsibility to look uh, and cast a very wide net and count and challenge conventional thinking in a way that can be heard to ensure that um, the, the diversity of the board reflects uh, um, broad thinking uh, and, and different opinions because our world really requires that now. And you're starting to see uh, those barriers break down. Um, the board that I'm on does have three women and Sheila raises an interesting point. I never thought of it that way when there's one or two, um, you know, there are those kinds of um, eyebrow raising moments, but now there are three of us, we all have very different backgrounds and we don't always agree and that's okay. And that's another thing I, I'd like to uh, raise uh, uh, that yes, you want the board to be collegial Yes, you want people to get along, but you're brought on the board to lead from a position of strength and express opinions that sometimes may not be held by the majority, um, but um, need to be said. And uh, I think women uh, in particular are extraordinarily well suited to uh, not always lead with the two by four, but say, say what needs to be said in a way that can be heard and understood and if necessary, with a fine point on it. Micheline, can you kind of take us through some of, I guess, your personal story about how you got started on boards? Uh, what's the experience been like for you? What role did men mentorship or sponsorship play in that? Yeah, so that's a really um, great question, uh, especially for so many of our, our um, viewers, uh, because a lot of times folks just don't really know how to get started. And um, I will say this, I will say that what's really unique about the way in which I wound up on um, the board of an energy company was the fact that I had previously served as the president of Executive Women of New Jersey and in the uh, president emeritus now. And so my um, branding, I guess, right, over time has really been that of ensuring that we were, I am speaking up for, for women and for um, uh, those who, whose voices are not nat naturally and traditionally centered in conversations um, that nevertheless impact them. Uh, as a result of that, I actually wind up getting a call from uh, the president and CEO of this particular company 
from LinkedIn. They literally saw, kept watching what I was posting on LinkedIn. Um, I've written several articles and published them, um, uh, uh, not under the, the branding of uh, my corporate entity, but on Medium or on you know, Thrive Global, et cetera, about these particular issues. And when I initially received the call, I thought it was a, a sourcing opportunity. And so I said yes straight away because I wanted to be able to make certain that I was a conduit for women with energy backgrounds or sustainability backgrounds um, uh, in order to, to literally um, have this, this, this role. What was really unique about it was the fact that at the end of the conversation, they said, well, thank you for giving us all of these names. We were actually interested in you. And we're interested in you for precisely what you just did because of the fact that you are consistently advocating for women, et cetera. The company that I happen to be on the board of, CMC Energy, is actually a woman owned and woman founded company, but they simply had a large majority of white males on their board. And so they were looking to diversify their board. They said, we need more women on the board, although we were founded as a woman owned company, et cetera. Um, and so we are also looking for someone to help us in the area of equity, right? And representation of um, uh, the fullness of society. But I will tell you this, that long before I ever received that phone call, I had mentors and friends who were CEOs of global companies, on boards of public companies, who would just talk to me about that interest and what I really needed to do to evidence a background that might be of interest to companies in the future. Um, and as a result of that, would oftentimes utilize um, a chance to raise my hand, to ask for a stretch assignment, to become a project champion for something that may not be within my you know, equity and wheelhouse and, and lobbying uh, and policy wheelhouse, but outside of that, to have a broader sense and sensitivity of the operation side of, of the business. Um, because I knew that in the future, what I wanted to do was to be a viable candidate for uh, such a role. So I really think that that network was really keenly um, uh, important for how I was to navigate right? Different decisions in my career so that I could wound up being an individual who really represented as um, an ideal candidate for later on down the road. And so I think that it's really important that we take a look now that our, our viewing um, and participating um, public takes a, an opportunity to really take a look at what is currently within their the profile that they are managing and how might they also be able to present um, uh, uh, a more balanced um, and more nuanced um, portfolio going forward, it may not necessarily be within the four corners of the doctrine of their job description, but undoubtedly there are opportunities for them there. And then of course, always making certain that we're taking every call from every recruiter, from everyone on LinkedIn who may be looking for someone else. I may not have the time to be on the next board, but I always wanna make certain that they understand that the pipeline of brilliant women is brewing over with talent. And that the fact that there simply are not viable candidates is the greatest myth of all time. And so just always making certain that we're taking those calls and understanding that those recruiters are looking at you too is also a good rule of thumb. That's, that's such an empowering statement. And I love that idea of the stretch assignment, um, pushing, kind of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Sheila, can you tell us about sort of your origin story and, and how you got started your onboard service? Yeah, and Michelin, I love what you just what you just said, especially about advocating for other women. Um, the first corporate board opportunity I had was when I was um, in my full time role as a as an executive. I was running a, a global corporate business for a major financial institution, and one of our board members wanted me to join his board. And so, without my knowledge, he approached my CEO, who told him no. Uh, that I couldn't join an outside board. To my everlasting gratitude, uh, the director went back to my CEO and said something that I believe to be true, that when you're already in the C-suite, the best development opportunity you can have is sitting on the other side of the table as a, as a corporate board member. So he pushed and he pushed. And one day after a, one of our board meetings, he came into my office and said, Sheila, I'd like you to join our board. I had no idea that this conversation was going on. And I think that's what so often happens. We're not aware that we're being considered. 
Um, so that was my first opportunity. And as you know, I've served on a good number of boards since then. Um, but the theme I think through all of them is it's about the network. It's about the network. It's about people who know you, who've mentored you, who've sponsored you, who are actors references for you. Um, and it comes from your nonprofit work, your work in the community, as well as your business activities. Um, and I would just say, having chaired several nominating governance committees, which is how the choice gets made of who is next to join the board, that the last question that gets asked is who knows this person? Who can mm -hmm. speak to their experience with this person? Who can we touch base with who can tell us what she's like when she's in the room, as opposed to what she's like on paper? And so that network and having people speak for you is enormously powerful for those of you who want to um, join boards. I think that's wonderful. And I just wanted to mention, I see some questions coming in from the audience. Please feel free to put those in as we speak and um, we're certainly gonna get to, to those in a few minutes. Sharon, uh, before we do that, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, beginnings on boards? How did, how did that role evolve for you? I think to uh, Sheila and Micheline's uh, uh, points made earlier, um, um, it, it, the, the network is, is extraordinarily important. I had a job where I had um, the opportunity and or as part of my role uh, to, to work on a number of economic development boards, um, academic boards, et cetera. And typically on those boards, you'll find very senior people. One board in particular um, um, was commissioned by the state of New Jersey and it had C-suite executives, a number of CEOs on that board. Um, my boss at the time was traveling internationally uh, quite often. So I took his place on that board and chaired a committee and worked closely with several of the CEOs one of whom was the CEO of the first board that I ultimately ended up joining. So I worked closely with him and another individual on that board happened to be uh, the lead director. Um, and um, as it turns out, you, you never can underestimate the power of networks or, or who knows you. As it turns out on this board, uh, when I walked into the room, I knew another one of the board members because I had worked with him on an educational board. Um, the chair of the investment committee knew someone who works for me. So he called him right up and said, what's she like as a boss? Um, there's another person on the board who turned, I'm in uh, an organization called the Executive Leadership Council. Um, what the, that board director's mentee, who was also in the energy field and on another board, was a very good friend of mine. And he and I worked on a committee who at uh, part of that organization. So to Sheila's point, when those questions were asked about, well, who knows Sharon? Um, several hands that I wasn't even aware of knew me, knew of me or knew me through someone else. And so, um, couple of points. If you're on a not-for-profit or economic development or academic board, you should put your best foot forward, do your best work, because that is your that builds your brand with people who matter and count. And to the extent that you deliver in those forms, uh, it, 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 positioned you, it positioned you rather as a candidate um, for uh, public company service because individuals have seen you in action, understand your body of work, know how you comport yourself in the room, know how you think, know how you manage conflict, and know whether or not you have uh, a have a um, reputation of getting things done. How, you know, this this question has come up a couple of times. Of sort of, how do you think about balancing board service with uh, an active executive career. Obviously, Micheline, you're doing this today. Sheila, you talked about coming on to uh, your first board and the fact that that would help you do your job as an executive. But how do you, how does that balance work in, in practice for you? Micheline, do you want to start? 
Sure, um, absolutely. You know, I, I get the question about how we balance a lot. Um, and I think that's because, um, right, we all have these bios that talk about, um, that, that give all the highlights of everything. Um, but I always say that I really think that we do whatever is of greatest priority to us. And so you apportion your time accordingly. As a result of being an executive, I oftentimes was I, I, representing the company or the CEO on a number of boards. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you really put your all into that as well. I know Sharon and I spent some time together as a result of, of one of those seats. Um, what's really keen about that is ensuring that yes, your employer is, um, uh, a first priority, but understand that this is also, right, um, a job duty for you. And you would merely uh, ensure that you have your, your CEO's um, uh, acquiescence to do so, um, that they've been informed and advised, um, that you have ensured that whatever outside work restrictions uh, that may be in place at your place of employment, that you've already declared those with your compliance officer. Um, and then you would portion your time accordingly. Um, I would absolutely do so. If in fact I was required, I would have taken PTO in order to do um, uh, my board service accordingly. I, that was not a requirement. And now I'm, I'm leading a, a national nonprofit where that board um, actually thought that it was fantastic that I'm considered a viable candidate for these roles. They believe that it's even better for the organization that they have a leader who is considered um, uh, for thought leadership along for profit boards. So I really think that it is um, possible, but you have to make certain that you are doing this in a manner where you are giving the integrity that both um, positions require. Sheila, do you have more to add there? Yes, thank you. Um... Well, first of all, I don't really believe in balance because I'm not sure any of us are ever <laughs> in balance. I do believe right. in cho choices, you know, so right. we make choices. And there are, there are some considerations that you have to bear in mind if you're a full-time executive. One is, you know, is the board going to require a lot of travel? That may not be the right fit. Um, can you see how it's going to bring something back to your company or to, to your role, which it certainly did for me, and it sounds as if that's been your experience too, Micheline. Um, so it, it is about making choices. It is about um, making sure that you take on a board that gives you energy so that you, you have the energy to conduct your full-time role and it's not depleting in some way. You probably can't take on a committee chairmanship um, because you know that, that takes extra time and effort. So I think it's a question of just being realistic and making sure that you're bringing back to your full-time role the benefits of serving on an outside board and getting those broadened perspectives. Yeah, and I, I would I would add to that as well um, to say that if you are working, you know, you can only do one public company board. Um, you know, I know that I know a person or two that tried to be Hercules and and, and take on more than one, and that's that's a failed strategy when you're working full time in a, in a, in a top executive role. Um, but, you know, I, I think that choosing carefully and learning something new um, is, is really something um, helpful to your role. Learning agility is, is something that's, that's really, really important. So I took a, I worked in financial services for 40 years, but I worked for, I joined the board of a public utility. So I'm learning a new business. I'm learning a new operating model. I'm learning a new finance model. Um, and those learnings um, do in, in their own way um, um, come back to support your, your day job role um, because it gives you a different perspective and it helps you um, compare and contrast best practices there versus where you are. Um, and you make the time to do the things that are important to you. And like Sheila and Micheline, none of us believe in balance. You get it done. <laughs> Uh, this is a great question from an audience member about kind of making the leap from nonprofit board service to corporate board service. I think we all recognize that those are two very different things, serving on the board of a nonprofit versus um, a corporation. So how do you think about uh, leveraging nonprofit board service to hopefully eventually move into a corporate board service role? Or what have you seen work for people? What are, what are things that don't work as well? I'll, I'll jump in, Leah, to get the conversation started. Um, I, I think there are actually more similarities than differences, especially mm -hmm. these days where nonprofit governance has moved closer to corporate governance, even as corporate governance continues to evolve. 
So I, I think it's a great opportunity to kind of step back from your regular activity and adopt a different role with a different group of people. It's an opportunity to take on some leadership positions that you haven't had before. It's an opportunity to learn about governance. Yes, it's still a leap to go from a nonprofit, even a major nonprofit, to a corporate board, because there are, as, as Sharon, I think you outlined at the beginning, some different um, requirements. But it's, it's, an, it's a very valuable stepping stone. Uh, it's an opportunity to expand your network. And it's an opportunity to take on leadership roles where you're, you're, you may not be deep in the subject matter of the organization. I can't agree more. I think that there are undoubtedly um, uh, some similarities that can be leveraged, quite frankly, if in fact you're an individual that and you're serving on uh, not-for-profit boards, make certain that you get into a role of leadership in that particular nonprofit um, board, make certain that you are really um, utilizing that, that opportunity to stretch you um, so that you develop the requisite skills so that you can go into um, your for-profit board um, opportunity saying, I've chaired an audit committee, right? I've, I've sat on governance. Um, I served as an officer of uh, a nonprofit organization, which is closely aligned. Um, I cannot agree more with what uh, Sheila just mentioned about the way in which nonprofits, especially national nonprofits, I really want, I would love for individuals to really consider that very deeply and understanding that so many national nonprofits really do um, uh, mirror the governance structure of corporate entities, I think even more so than local nonprofits do, and that those opportunities are looked at as being quite analogous. Um, the serving on uh, for-profit boards and, and understanding what that nuance is and really utilizing that to, to gain the experience. And then very quickly, two things that both Sheila and then Sharon said that really, I, I kind of heard the, the sky open up and the angels begin to sing. Um, and that was one when Sheila talked about, you know, make certain that you're getting on a board that energizes you. I, I, I have such joy in participating on the board that I'm on because truly, um, you know, we're, I'm learning something new to Sharon's point, um, that intellectual curiosity just feeds your spirit um, and, and really um, helps to, to, to make certain that you are, you feel like you are gaining and not being further depleted, right? And so I think that those are really interesting things that you can also do as you are on nonprofit boards too. People are really interested in what did you do? What impact did you have when you're on these boards? You know, there's this misnomer, it's not true, but um, it's a belief among some that some people join these national boards to put their name on a letterhead. Well, you know, if you join one of these boards and to Micheline's point, um, you chair a committee, you solve a big problem for them, you bring resources to bear out of your network uh, to help them meet a, a major goal or objective that they might have. Public company boards are interested about the impact you had in the places that you've been that they can go back and verify. And not-for-profit boards, particularly national ones, and in some instances, even smaller ones, give one the opportunity to really bring your best self to the table and help enable goals and objectives and, and find results for those organizations. So um, but that's a place where you can really bring your A game, help solve a problem and use that as a stepping stone of, or a positive proof point, if you would, of things that you might uh, bring to uh, a public company board in a different way. I find this question in a couple of forms, uh, but I think it would be great if you could talk for a second about what does it actually take to serve on a nonprofit board? Um, what are they looking for? What does that mean other than maybe many of us have heard about, you know, the person who's able to write a big check and sort of gets on the board. How else does someone get on the board of one of these nonprofits? And then separately, what does it take then to get on the, to the board of a corporation? What are they looking for? Do you have to be an executive of a company in order to be um, kind of considered for a role like that? Well, it's sure. said that to serve on a nonprofit board, you need wealth, work, and wisdom. Um, and, you know, the, the wealth piece is if it's an organization you believe in, you're going to want to contribute to support it. Um, the work piece is you're going to show up and do the job. Um, and and as, as you just said, Sharon, not just lend your name to the letterhead, but the wisdom piece, I think, is, is, is really important because that's where you're giving advice. 
that's where you're giving feedback. That's where you're bringing a, a perspective to the discussions. Um, when you then shift to corporate boards, there still is a preference to have people who've been in profit and loss management kinds of roles. Although I, I, in recent years, I've seen a broadening to have uh, human resources professionals, uh, obviously to have financial professionals, um, but also to have, as I said earlier, digital people with digital experience, with sustainability experience, with technology experience more widely. So that there's, there's an important um, aspect of serving on a corporate board that you've got to be in a position to comment and contribute across a broad range of topics, strategy, yes. finance, operations, risk, you know, a really wide range, talent and succession. And so you need to have those experiences and capabilities in your background. And you know, you have to, um... Um, really look at your background and experience and be able to explain it and position it in a way that um, breathes life into the depth and breadth of your experience. Sometimes a title alone doesn't really share the diversity of the work experiences you will have had. So people often will wonder, well, as an HR person, do you know anything about finance or, or et cetera. Well, I was the one of three fiduciaries of our multi-billion dollar pension plan. Yes, I, I do understand that body of work. Um, I ran a large operational center along the way. I've had uh, jobs where we've had to do outsourcing and other types of, 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 of related fields where you had to build a business case, et cetera, along the way. So you have to um, position your body of work in a way that resonates to an organization that you're, you're uh, interested in. And to a point that I think both Sheila and Michelin have, have raised, um, other, there are other ways besides your day job to gain a broader level of experience and you should take full advantage of those things uh, and then be able to uh, leverage the work that you've done um, with positive proof points, and that will help really better position you as a more viable candidate for public company boards. Yes, they are um, looking, I think, at, at a broader spectrum of people now, but you need to be a broad thinker. You need to understand you know, how the company makes money. You need to have uh, strategic thinking, and they, they are looking to bridge, they, they are looking to bring, to Micheline's point, a diversity of thought and skill sets to the board. And the, the blending of that together, I think um, creates a high performing board. Uh, here's another question I'd like to get to, which is about sort of this board composition question and obviously looking at the evolution of boards and how they are becoming more diverse. Are your boards in particular actively looking at gender parity issues? Sheila, you mentioned the, the gender balance on one of your boards. But um, for the others, are your boards looking at those numbers? Do they have a goal? Are you aware of the goal? Are they, do they have goals with respect to racial diversity, gender diversity? Where does, where does the conversation stand right now? So I will say this. Um, I will say that that was really interesting. And, and um, of course the board has a matrix and they're looking for individuals of certain backgrounds in order to ensure that they are, are um, filling areas that they feel that they could have right greater um, uh, expertise in around the table. They're not necessarily looking for um, uh, you know X number of women to fill this, X number of women to, uh, of, of color in particular. Um, but I will say this, what I, I will say is that um, you know as a result of the environment in which we currently find ourselves, as a result of being in the midst of a, a, a global pandemic and a national uh, and international reawakening around racial justice, many companies are trying to figure out their own footing. And so they are looking for the different um, uh, voices in order to help them best understand what that needs to look like for them in a manner that is customized to their industry and to their entity and to their employee base. Right. And so as a result of that, what I will say is that they are, in fact, um, looking for uh, diversity of thought, but also diversity of background. And the, the first it's almost like the first uh, recognition of the fact that 
um, the traditional guys around the table don't actually represent everyone. Um, and as a result of that, they also now understand that they don't understand um, naturally, inherently, the lived experience of everyone else, right? So why am I saying that? I'm saying that because any sound company is going to want to ensure that as they're looking for diverse um, uh, board members, that they really are also looking for those that are going to help guide them through the navigation of this season in particular, because they know how their customers, their clientele, and their stakeholders are looking for them to respond. And, and I will just add, um, I said earlier that we have to be intentional about this, because I think if we're not, we go back to the same old networks and right. the same old networks bring us the same old result. And I found um, in working with search firms that I've had to be really insistent that this is the profile we're looking for. And you can surface other names, but we won't consider them. So you know, you've really got to stick to your guns when you're trying to build a board of diverse backgrounds, diverse perspectives, diverse experiences. You have really got to stick to it. Otherwise you get more of the same. And we've, we've had more of the same. We need change. You know, I think that the board uh, that I've been, that I'm on, you know, on um, to Sheila's point, I think they've been purposeful. So, you know, there are three women, three African-Americans, uh, and uh, the remaining are, are, are uh, uh, Caucasian males. But that said, we're all very different. We all have very different backgrounds. And I think the board is a high performing board. But um, I think that we were intentional around ensuring that women were part of this board, that people of color were part of this board, that industry professionals were part of that, this board, and, and general business people were part of this board. And the board, um, I think, um, performs well and the company is doing well. So I think we're proof positive that it can be done. You have to be intentional about it. And there are people out there who fit the profile um, that um, we, we we're looking for you. Sometimes you have to look a little harder and sometimes you have to, um, you know, poke or be um, uh, just a bit of a curmudgeon with the search firms when they don't send you what you asked for. Um, and you have to guard against, you know, my friend over here or the guy in the golf course there, or my friend over here, you know, no, we, we have a process and a protocol and a, a, that we're going to follow and we're going to be very purposeful. And I think it's, it's proof positive that you can find high performing, highly talented people who are very interested in, in willing workers to be a part of the organization. And Michelin said it earlier, it's, it's not a supply problem, it's a demand problem. Exactly right. Uh, maybe we could just kind of go around and, and hear some final thoughts or pearls of wisdom that you'd like to leave um, the audience members with. Let's start with you, Micheline. So um, I'd love to be able to charge our audience with um, not giving up. Um, there are lots of folks who feel that they just don't have that network or they just don't, right? They're just not at that level as of yet in their career. You never know how closely you are being watched know that. You never know. I love the story that Sharon shared about the fact that there are all these different individuals who were able to testify to uh, her work product and her comportment. You never, ever know that. So you need to treat every single individual with whom you are interacting with the same level of incredible respect, admiration, and your work with the same level of integrity. Um, because quite frankly, it, it shall be discussed. Um, my uh, colleague, uh, Sheila, just just said something earlier about the, the fact that um, so often individuals are also look, kind of looking for fit, right? They, they want to know how someone engages with you off of, of paper. And that was undoubtedly something that was an aspect of my recruitment effort. And they came back to me and said, you should know that you're really very well liked, right? So treat everyone that you meet as if you were on that, that interview, because trust me, you actually are, and that you can do this when the time is right. Sharon, how about you? Um, I, I think that, you know, lift others as you climb. I think that women have to get better at this. Um, um, it's not enough to just be the first or the only. You know, we will not um, solve this problem if each one doesn't 
lift one and bring one. There's room at the table for more than one or two or even three. And men have never had a problem with that. So I think that this notion of putting your best foot forward, bringing your best self to anything that you um, sign up to do will serve you well over time. For, so for those of you who uh, are thinking that I, I'll never get asked, you continue to put your best foot forward, do your best work, take those building block opportunities and you will get there. And when you do, bring someone along with you. You will be better respected by your colleagues if you do that than, than not. Lift others as you climb and we can help enable the solution to this problem. Uh, lift others as you, as you climb that. That will stick with me. How about you, Sheila? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, it's a journey. Um, we're all on a journey. And um, I would say, if you want to join a board or join another board, know, know why, know why you want to do it. Um, let people know that you're interested in doing it. It's back to the network. And um, think about situations where half the time you'll be contributing and half the time you'll be learning because that's probably the right kind of balance. Um, but do think about the network because for all of us who've been on this panel, that has been the crucial determinant in the choices that we've had the opportunity to, to make. Well, I wanna thank you all so much. This was such a wonderful way to spend an hour and we're so lucky to have had all of you with us. I also wanna thank the participants for sending some questions. There were some that we didn't get to, but we'll try to follow up um, via email with that. So, with that, I want to send it back to you, Sarah, for some closing remarks. I just want to add my own thanks to our incredible panel, um, all of whom I know well and all of whom have shared unique and really inspiring journeys. And I'm inspired by uh, what you've done, where, where you are now, and where you're going to go uh, at some point. And um, I'm so delighted to have you part of our Women at NJPAC community. So thank you for your time. I know how busy you are. And uh, we're so grateful for, for, your, um, for your time today. Um, so thank you. Um, I do want to thank everybody who joined us from home and from work for joining us for this fascinating conversation. Um, and we hope you'll stick with us. Uh, we have a couple of upcoming conversations that we invite you to join us on Tuesday, June 8th at 7 p.m. Uh, we've got uh, Grammy Award winners, Angelique Kidjo and Cecile McLaurin Salvant. And if you don't know either one of those women, they are incredible performers. They have both come out with exciting new albums over the pandemic, and they will be um, joining us for a virtual online conversation um, uh, on June 8th at 7 p.m. So you can sign up for that. Uh, we also hope if you have young creatives in your life, if you have children who are interested, uh, this summer we'll be having virtual arts education programs in hip hop, musical theater, acting, and jazz. Um, we hope you'll sign up. I am the happy um, parent of an alum of NJ Pax um, arts ed programs, and uh, he's about to graduate from college with a jazz degree. So who would have figured? Uh, and we do invite you back to NJPAC in person starting this summer when we will launch our Horizon Foundation Sounds of the City uh, on Thursday, July 15th, uh, weekly on Thursdays um, through July and August. It will be safe, it will be exciting, and we can't wait to have you all back on our campus. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you for coming back. And until then, stay well and um, have a great day, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.